psyche like? This is like what? Like freshman year, second uh, sophomore? Uh, I no, these were these were uh, junior level students. Yeah, but I, we can do it almost every time. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, we in fact, next quarter I'm going to try it with graduate students. We could have a summer school just for this. <laughs> Two days of this, right? I mean, <laughs> we wouldn't get enough offensive. Um, so, I, I think I may have some answers for the question that you raised in your presentation. Okay. Uh, you know a little bit about this, but uh, maybe uh, we'll formalize this. So, a few years ago, actually, at Stony Brook, I started teaching a class which was called Introduction to Mechanical Engineering, but you know, it was incredibly boring for me to teach that class. So I turned that into a project-driven design class. I called it Freshman Design Innovation, but informally I called it Fun in Design Innovation. Uh, and the idea is that the students in freshman year, so this is like first semester in the school, uh, design and build robots, whatever kind of robots they want to build. And in the context of doing that, they learn about mechanical design, mechanism design to some extent, without throwing any three position, four position, or curvature theories at them. Let them just have fun, design and build stuff. They have to put their own electronic circuit together. They have to do microcontroller programming. We use Arduino as our platform for programming. Um, and one thing I realized when I put that course together was, when I asked them to put the robots together, the big question was, how are they going to do it? What are the pieces they will use to put it together? So initially, I encouraged them to use household car components, parts, uh, scavenger uh, motors, uh, like stepper motors, the gears and all that from old fax machines and scanners and whatnot. Um, and that was fun. I mean, the students were very creative uh, and they were able to put together really decent robots. Some of them would use like Lego uh, or like skits to, to do that. But I found that the level playing field was, was not good because some, the quality of the prototypes was differing quite a bit from teams to teams. So I begin to think how I can sort of uh, maybe create something that that all the students in the class can use. And I had a laser cutter in my lab, so I figured out that I could at least put together a small two wheel differential drive robot and I could give it to them. And this was like four years ago almost, uh, and some of the students, actually all three of them were standing back, they were the TAs for that class at some point. So they know the journey that, that I've gone through, uh, and they've been part of that journey. So that's, it's, it's incredible that we are all here to today. Uh, and then, Things moved pretty, pretty fast after that. We put this kit together. It was supposed to be like intuitive, modular, low cost. Everything was going to be laser cut, which means everything had to be done from planar pieces, flat sheets of plastic. Uh, and it turned into a, a pretty comprehensive robot kit that the schools got interested in, the camps got interested in. So I wrote a grant to SBIS, TTR program, NSF. We got some funding this year to develop this for everybody, actually. Uh, so here we are. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that and we're going to give you a robot kit to play with and you'll put together a, one of the walking robots that Mike showed. Uh, so there are two pieces to making that work. One is the app. That Motion Gen is our apps, like our homegrown app that Mike has blogged about on his website. So, and this was like part of my, of my TEDx talk. There's only one TEDx talk uh, a few years ago. At that time it was like crude sort of an app that functioned, but the, app, the interface was not very good. So now we have this available, and you can do like four bar simulation, you can do four bar synthesis, and I'll show you how that app works. But we also have a web version, which is available on CatCam. And I have another graduate student, she's working on uh, developing even a better version that will be, you know, that will work better, I think, for the kids, not just for engineering students. Uh, so I'll show you how that thing works. Okay, and the robot kit, the physical robot kit, we call it Snappy Exo. I won't tell you why we call it Snappy Exo, maybe you'll figure it out. You can build like simple structures for the kids, you can build you know, walking machine, that's, so that's uh, actually a six bar walking machine that something like that we put together. Uh, so it's simple two wheel differential drive robots, something more complex, right, that's on the right side. Uh, for my class, we use mostly acrylic, not wood, because we find it's easier to laser cut. So. Acrylic works very well for us, it's low cost plastic, but for the outside, you know, we mostly use dull ray, which is hard to cut, but it works very well. Um, some of the pieces you will see in the kit that we'll give to you will look like this. I just wanted to show you what they, why we call them like 6X and 9X beam, because we count the X's, they're like six of those or nine of those. And then we have very few connectors, so unlike Lego and West, uh, my philosophy has been to minimize the diversity of the parts so that the screens can associate the function with, with what it looks like. Okay. 
Okay, so if I say there's an L clip, then the L clip basically that looks like you know, sort of a two perpendicular arms, they give you perpendicularity. So geometric constraints, the kinematic constraints that you need for your robots, you should be able to figure those out by looking at these connections. So you won't have all of these in, in the box that we give you, uh, but uh, quite a few of those. Uh, this is the robot, let me see if I can play this video. This is the robot that you guys will put together. Okay, so we'll give you the instructions and there is a simple approach, so it's not try and try. So we have spent a lot of time figuring out how to create those connectors that will give you the rotational joints and different planes, uh, so we don't need to use brass for that. Um, okay, so this is, uh, this is where you can see we have simulated this using motion jet. Um, and this is again a six-part mechanism with a couple of this slides so I can show you. So in the motion gen, you can import a picture. And so what we did was we built the robot into the picture, imported it, and you can sketch right on top of that. So like you were showing some of those pattern drawings and you had drawn the GeoGebra constructions on top of that, we can do something similar. You can bring in any picture, any image you want and sketch on top of it. So you can see that there's a four part here, right here is the crank, and this pink colored beam is the coupler. And that's a lot, right? So you got a four bar and it gives you like this kind of path. In reality, you won't get this path because once the machine gets loaded, because of the weight, dynamics will play a role. The kinematics shows this is the path, but in reality, you will see it's pretty smooth walking motion. And that's not something we can predict, but as long as we get close to what Professor Patarzi was showing before, it would be fine. Uh, in our case, this allows it to lift the leg a little bit more. So it has, it, it gets a little bit more traction when it walks. It's not, instead of keeping a straight line to the ground and trying to design that, we lift the leg a little bit more. And as long as it's stable, it will, it will do fine. To provide the stability, instead of using the wheels that we sort of have to about, we have actually a rocker to set as a leg. So there's a rocker that connects to this pole bar. So you can see that the coupler, this point of the coupler, actually connects and that's another pole bar for you, right? So four bar, connect to the coupler, and you get another four bar. Um, the electronics wiring is actually fairly straightforward. So it's in the instructions. You will see if there's a small breadboard where you do the connection. But if you get if you if you have difficulty understanding how to do that, you just raise your hand, and one of us will come and help you with that. Uh, before I show you this little video, um, just for the fun, while Professor Bagarki was showing. The, uh, the mechanism where we could change the, the scale it. I sketched this in motion gen. So I think this, this is what it looks like where you attach a parallelogram. Is that the one that you're showing the last this one? Skew the skew parallelogram, right? Yes. Uh, it is close. Yeah, yeah, kind of, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so the motion gen, uh, this is the web version I'm showing you right now. Except the, re the reason why we know it's not right yeah. is that the it would match the coupler curve exactly. Exactly, right, yes, okay. yeah. And, and I think, you know, that's the part where you can select these links and change the angles, so on the oh, sides. I'll, I'll show you. When, yeah. when they're working, I'll show you. Yeah. Okay, we'll do that. So, uh, let me show you very quickly how we can sketch things here. Let me just delete this. So this is an RR diet. So what I'll do is I'll use my mouse. So if I sketch something like this, right? Well, that's the basis for like kind of a four bar walking robot. You have a coupler, you have a crank, and the coupler traces this kind of trajectory, which is a little bit tilted, not exactly like a straight line close to the ground, but it'll work if you put this together and attach like a simple motor, do like two of those on two sides, it should work fine. Um, for the examples, you can see the clans is that Magarty was talking about. So all these things are uh, pretty easy to do uh, with the motion gen. And uh, GeoGebra is a fantastic tool. Uh, I wish I had discovered it before. I think I tried it a few years ago. I found it a little bit difficult to, to, to work with. So so this is what our students use in the department uh, to, to uh, simulate mechanism, but this is not just for the simulation. Uh, actually, you can input positions, and it uses our algorithms to design four-bar mechanism in real time. And you can see that you do get the four-bar mechanism that goes through all these five poses, but they have certain defect and branch defect problems. And those are the kinds of things that uh, my PhD student should not is working on using machine learning to solve these problems. So, uh, because these have been 
problems that have been around for a very long time. So you can interactively tweak any of these conditions, and you will see how the full body system changes. OK? Uh, all right. Before we give you a little bit of a kit, you know, you have any questions for Mr. Oh, we'll keep going. Oh, you can yeah. ask me questions anytime. Let's go ahead and... Why don't you have a question? What, Mark? After all these years. <laughs> so, for the, this paragraph and the trans... I don't know if I have to translate my strategy. Yeah. Can I do those? Only add two things? No, they... Um, or, no. The... the um, well, it depends on which of the two cases you are. If, if you're talking about it for a four-bar mechanism, yeah, the, the uh, translating link is two more links. Okay. And the uh, skewed uh, pantograph is two more links. So, but if you're doing it with the, um, uh, with the function generator, the translating links are a complete parallelogram. You have to a complete parallelogram. That's four more things. Yeah. And then the skewed pentagram is also So you're, you're making a pretty complicated mechanism by the time you get well, to one. Two more lengths really isn't that bad. No, no, two, no, no. So that actually, I think, is the real winner is to use, uh, to use curvature theory to get the, uh, the, the coupler curve you want and add two more links to get the leg mechanism you want. Yeah. One question. There is, there is of course uh, now the straight line mechanism is called the lifting crossing here. Yes, yes. Why didn't you use that? Did you find it? Well, no, no, no. The Lipkin, actually, that, that uh, Lipkin crossing line mechanism, you can actually see in these mechanisms as well. <laughs> so it's related to the, it's related to all of this stuff. So, so yeah. it's a, a variation of the one that you present? Well, it, 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 in a way, it's the other way around. You know, the kind of the, the principles that are in the closer than mechanism we can exploit these skew pentagraphs and skew pentagraphs. And, the skew pentagraphs, yeah. and one, so, uh, one question for both of you. Yeah. Do you think you have a problem of the of your uh, models going sideways when they work? Instead of going a straight line, they move either left or right? You mean like physically when you put yes. them together? Yeah, of course. So it depends, right? If you have like two motors, <coughs> that would inevitably happen with the two motors we got. Okay. Sense to me. But what we do is we generate for the walking machines without any robots in them. But we have one motor, two shafts on two sides. So that essentially shows that we're all listening to So, you know, what you're really talking about, you're saying how you coordinate the legs, right? No, it's because it, at least in simulations, we built a few, mod a few models, but either we're not very successful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we found that in simulations, that introducing dynamics, you all, you always get a path that is not straight lines. Gotcha. So it becomes right. sideways. Yeah. Well, it, that, that's absolutely the case. Right? These things don't move in straight lines because of the dynamics of the system. But what's more interesting is, I would say, is that what if you want it to turn? Right? Because this is a one degree of freedom system now attach the mechanisms so that they are in phase. And if they're in phase, they're going to go in a straight line. What if you want them out of phase so they can turn? Right? And it turns out that that's doable, but that takes a little bit more work. Uh, but that's, you know, it's, it takes a lot of thinking, actually, to make that work. So there, you can actually, so you, one, of, one of our robotics friends who say, well, why are you making a leg that's only one degree of freedom? That's like stupid. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, all right, well, let's think about what it takes to walk. Right? You've got a lot of controllers that you're, you're asked. You're, you've got a very high computational load where part of the problem, you really don't need it. You know, If you could just get the legs to move and, and design them so they absorb all the internal forces, you can now save some of your computation for other tasks, you know, such as turning and navigation and direction and all of that. And you can use suspensions. You, know, you, you can sort of think of it more like an automobile, where the leg is now a wheel instead of a, uh, a complete robot into itself. But you now have to, you have to think about things. Yeah. Right. Any other questions? Okay. So, um, we're going to just play this video out of place. We'll give you the kits, and uh, we can get started with the exercise. Well, it's not my question. Alright, 
so you get to have some fun with these kids. Where are they? Are they right here? Oh, how many did you bring? Uh, so we have 20 kids here. So you team up, right? Team up. Yeah. Yeah. Two people work together. That's, that's a better way. All right.